Yeah, we're recording. So, hey, this is the this, this is the Sustainiacs, Michael Vincent. Welcome back. I am the Sustainiac. The other Sustainiac today is Jonathan Overly. Jonathan, I met you at it was Tritium, right uh, up near Nashville. I think it was isn't it? Tritium, uh, uh, Australian company, I believe. Right, came over and were opening their plant to make EV electric vehicles charging stations, and they had their grand opening. They had like the embassy guy, the the ambassador from uh, Australia was there and everybody else. And uh, we ran into each other there. And um, hey, you and I are both sustainably minded trying to do things. And we've been trying to schedule this particular podcast for, I don't know, it seems like 17 years. It hadn't been that long, but it seems close to 17 years for for some reason. But um, tell everybody who you are. You're with East Tennessee Clean Fuels Coalition. I don't know if you're the owner, founder, the director, the janitor. What what, what do you do in there, Jonathan? Well, I think I started off as a janitor, but I was the founder and uh, just recently got the title changed to CEO from uh, director. So when you start wow. getting, I guess, eight employees, at some point, the responsibility levels go far enough to where you might get that title. But uh, um, started the East Tennessee Clean Fuels Coalition in 2001. It took us a few years to get designated with the USDOE Clean Cities Program, which basically nationwide, and there's like 70, 75 coalitions, work in communities or across entire states to uh, focus on alternative fuels use and increasing it. Basically, originally based in uh, trying to improve human health in areas where there was more congestion. It started with clean cities because I thought clean c- cities was all it was going to be. Um, but then we've realized how important it is to make sure everyone gets an option to get funding, use propane, natural gas, electric vehicles, biofuels, whatever it is. And that's been most of what we've done over the last, you know, almost 20 years is help fleets look at those different fuels and try to figure out what, what can work for them while we reduce pollution, both criteria pollutant emissions that are important for local health as well as greenhouse gas emissions. Wow. Okay. So that that's a mouthful, dude. And you practiced that. I swear you had to practice that because that was really, really well done. <laughs> you say it or a hundred times, so many... you get used to it. What's that? You say it a hundred times, you kind of get used to it. At least a hundred times, right? So you guys have been around since 2001. So this isn't a new, new, new thing for you guys. 22 years last count, right? So that that that's a while and that, congratulations for that longevity is it is it picking up like crazy now is it has it changed was it a hard kind of road to get people interested in going you know what we need to look at alternative fuels because it seems like now more than ever it's 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 the talk right and and we we've, we've been through ebbs and flows i remember in the early days just really focusing more on knox and surrounding counties we'd have 30 35 fleet managers show up to monthly meetings. And uh, we did that for several years. We started expanding our reach. We didn't have as many meetings. I think we went to quarterly meetings. But yeah, we've we've gone through cycles where late double zeros, biofuels really got popular. Salicylic ethanol plant opened in East Tennessee. We focused on ethanol a lot. Uh, University of Tennessee and their fleet of uh, vehicles that staff faculty can use. Um, would use E85 that was like 85% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions because it was made from cellulose ethanol in East Tennessee. Um, Then, you know, CNG and propane have kind of always been there. Propane's always been the redheaded stepchild, although it's a great alternative fuel. Uh, Compressed natural gas has come through in ebbs and flows, but then, yeah, over the last, you know, five to 10 years, electrics, the rise of electrics has made it to where uh, probably 70% of our time is focused on electric vehicles. So wow. it has it it, gone through. I mean, it, obviously federal funding helps a lot of fleets get started with programs. We want it to be seed funding. We don't want them to be addicted to the federal teat. Um, and, and that's helped and that's started a lot of programs. <clears throat> but uh, it has been cyclical, but but EV seems to be the, uh, the darling right now and for good reason. Okay, let's explain that because I was going to ask you, you know, you go into EV. So first of all, before we get into that, and we and we we're going to do that because we, we need to understand EV and all the alternative fuels. Why EV is the darling? Should it be the darling? Should it not be the darling? There's a lot of people, you know, and myself included, said it's not as green as you think it is, right? So you're going to clear a lot of that that stuff up and probably correct me with a lot of er- erroneous statements and probably thoughts that you get from reading the media and 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 all that kind of stuff. But um, 
so why is somebody contacting you? Why, why should somebody be paying t- attention to you guys? Why should they be coming to those meetings, etc.? What exactly are you going to do for a fleet? And is it only fleet and commercials? So <clears throat> if a company can't be fiscally sustainable, then they can't be sustainable, period. Completely get that. So things have to be fiscally sustainable for someone to do them. Whether they want to use biodiesel, natural gas, or electric, this has to pencil out. So um, that, that's the first thought. Um, and I've actually been accused of not doing what I'm supposed to be doing correctly because I will get into economics and some people in different industries like, you're not supposed to worry about that. You're supposed to be the save the planet guy. I'm like, well, if I have to work with people that have to implement this, then that doesn't, that doesn't work a lot of the time. Yeah. So I remember in the early days helping Eastman use biodiesel and they had, I don't know, over a hundred vehicles using a blend of biodiesel. And then I think they were increasing the blend. And one time they had a crane go out, something happened. Still not sure that biodiesel was the problem, but it was, it was labeled the culprit. It certainly could have been. And it like stopped them for a day. They had so many people focused on working in this project. And all of a sudden the key piece of equipment wouldn't work that they lost yeah, a lot all. of money in that one day. Yeah, it's not good at all. It's not good. <clears throat> so we got to make sure things are ready to be used on a regular basis, maintained by the people that maintain them, their own staff, outside assistants that fix things, class eight trucks, whatever it is. Um, and that they accurately look at the fiscal as well as the environmental side. In most cases, the environmental side is pretty clear. Um, the fiscals need to be, be figured out. To your point on electric vehicles, I was just talking with a a gentleman in rural Tennessee interested in getting electric school buses. And we were looking at their rate schedule. If they tack onto the rate schedule on the building that they're in, then they will probably have demand charges each month for those electric buses that are going to kill a significant part of their monthly cost savings. If they can get, whether it costs $20,000 or $50,000 or maybe more to get a new service pulled, if they can do that based on the number of buses they have, they won't have any demand charges. And all of a sudden they'll be saving, you know, 50 to 70 percent of their monthly fuel cost. So that's just one thing where you really have to go in and investigate them, their fleet, how they operate, the particulars of some of the costs they may have to make sure something's going to fiscally work for somebody. See, that makes that that makes a lot of sense. And thank you for that. So in the EV, when you're talking about a uh, an, a, another um, a draw or another pull. You're talking about infrastructure in there to pull more electricity to be able to then charge those buses, right? Because I've I've seen Nikola tests where they actually bring in the Nikola tray, where they actually have to bring in a diesel generator because they're not allowed to draw from the grid in order to charge it at night, right? That's exactly right, and they um, so so it needs to. If this particular fleet chose to go with over three or four electric buses. They're probably going to run into this problem either way, and it may kill the project. It depends on the power that the local power company has to pull from to make a new service. Um, you get into other fuels. If, if we were talking compressed natural gas, if we want to build a new public CNG station in Chattanooga or Crossville or wherever, um, if they choose a location that has a low pressure on the pipe, let's say it's 15 PSI, versus somehow somebody gets lucky and has a 200 PSI spot, that can save them big time on the size of the compressor, the amount of storage they need to do compressed natural gas. So little things like this can be big players in terms of the whole cost someone gonna have to try to implement a project, start using a certain alternative fuel. So depending on where you're at, the gas supply may not be the same PSI. I mean, is there a minimum PSI? Cause 20 to 200 is a huge change, right? It, it is. And I mean, they're going to 3,600, really 4,000 to 4,500 PSI before you get it into the truck or the vehicle. So it actually does. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm no uh, compressor engineer, but, but needing a compressor to go from 150 or 200 PSI to a big number like 4,000, apparently is just a whole lot easier than going from 15 PSI. There's something about starting that compression that is significant to the sizing that you need. So wow. 
Yeah. That's really interesting. So let's and talk it about on where the pipes are in a city as to what pressure is going to be on those pipes. Is it near to the source or something like that? Is is higher pressure and it, it dies off as you're down the chain or something? Or how does that work? It's probably a combination of the pipe sizes, the uh, other users yeah. you have in that area. You know, if we're an industrial area, we might be lucky because they got a lot of pressure on the pipe because they have a lot of industrial customers. We also might be unlucky because there's a lot of pressure there, but it's just being used based on all the natural gas needs down that road or in that area. So, John, let, let me ask you this, John, because it's, you know, you're, I'm reading a lot of things about how, like, you know, stoves, natural gas stoves, et cetera, are being like, I think New York just said no more natural gas stoves, right? Which sucks because I, I'm, I'm a foodie kind of person and cooking with gas is way better than electricity if you're trying to cook on a, you know, if you're cooking on a regular basis. But does that affect that compressed natural gas as a, as a fuel, those type of things, or are those bands just purely residential usage? Or do you know? I don't know a lot about that. What I do know is there are some electric based people initiatives to try to remove all fossil fuels. <clears throat> and to the point of CNG, uh, I'm a big fan of in over the road long haul trucks. Let's use CNG okay. and RNG, renewably produced CNG. Okay. Because we can get huge greenhouse gas reductions. And we already have. I don't know, I think it's seven to 800 public CNG stations across the country. Even if we needed to put, let's call it a hundred well-placed, nice public CNG stations. And I don't know if I've ever heard of a CNG station costing $5 million. But let's say it did. A hundred times 5 million is $500, $500 million. We're EPA clean school bus. Just that one pocket of money is 5 billion that came out Ooh. last year. Yeah. So yeah, even yeah, yeah. if we look now, a lot of federal money is flowing right now to try to you know produce greenhouse gas emissions and kickstart industries and hydrogen and electric across the country. But just looking at that as one example, a hundred new public CNG stations, we'd spend a half a billion compared to at least two pockets that are just five billion that have come out recently. Um, and that would mean if you just look at Tennessee, there would be two new public CNG stations. Um, for long haul trucking, there's a number of reasons why that really hasn't worked in the past because we didn't have what has now come out, which is the 15 liter Cummins CNG engine, which can also run hydrogen. Yeah, and, and I've been watching. Are, I've been watching David King's post on that. That's a really nice engine. That's a really good advancement, right? Just saw it at. Uh, I don't think fleets can get it until next year, but. Um, if you talk about like a Chattanooga fleet that has a turnaround and go west on I-24, um, what's what's the mountain called going up to uh, That's up. Swanee? Oh, Ridge up top? to Swanee. Not F Mon Eagle? I guess it's Mon Eagle. Yeah, up to Mon Eagle. Um, yep. That's a big hill. And so yes. <laughs> a trucking fleet out of Chattanooga you know, the, the 400, 450 horsepower previous 11.9 liter engine for CNG that we had just wasn't going to cut it for them. So they haven't had something that's really serviceable to go a long distance because we can get enough CNG on board a Class 8 tractor so they can go seven 800 miles, but they haven't had the power. So that's going to be overcome. And um, I, just personally, as much as I love electricity, because especially in Tennessee, the greenhouse gas reductions associated with making the switch from gas or diesel to electric are substantial. Um, I think it's that way in a lot of other states. You know, Ohio versus Washington State. Washington State's got a lot of hydro, very low greenhouse gas footprint associated with the electricity. Ohio probably has a pretty high coal number. So the greenhouse gas reductions are going to be reduced, but they're still probably 20 to 40 percent for somebody switching a gasoline or diesel vehicle over to electric. But electric just has so many, um, pun intended, mountains to climb for long haul that if, if, if we would nationally invest in compressed natural gas and use the renewable natural gas that has gone from in around 2010 being minuscule numbers of the total compressed natural gas used in the country for transportation to now it's 70 percent. 70% of all the CNG used for transportation in the country is using renewably sourced natural gas. When you talk about landfills, wastewater treatment systems, dairy operations, 
if we can continue to grow that, we could be hitting fairly significant greenhouse gas reduction numbers in vehicles that can go the distance. And then once they can get the 15 liter engine, have the horsepower in terms of looking at that one aspect of transportation and the greenhouse gas emissions uh, attached issues that we have in the U.S. That's really, really interesting. So you're saying the the alternative fuels, in, in particular CNG and RNG, uh, for for long haul, right? But not so much for lo- like local cartage, et cetera, and and commercial use. You do you think that's more a, a solution that electricity is uh, EVs are 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 better suited for? The the more local it stays, yes. The longer, if it's a spoke model where somebody from Chattanooga has to go, they have fleets that go to Nashville and Birmingham, Atlanta and Asheville, or whatever directions you want to call it, um, depending on how far they have to go, I would think that when, to your point, getting started, electric is fantastic in many ways. We have a lot of things to figure out, including additional electric supply, even though we have a lot of grid capacity if people are going to charge at night, which is the typical mantra when we talk about light duty EVs or even fleets that come home, we've got the spare capacity then. If we start talking about things like the megawatt charger for a class eight truck, even if it's a truck and all it does is run Chattanooga to Birmingham and back, that megawatt charger, that's one megawatt hour per hour. That's 1000 kilowatt hours in an hour you need to charge that truck with. I, th- I think, The standards we have, the equipment, the offerings are going to be there. But what's it going to look like to the Chattanooga grid if all of a sudden you got a company that's got, I mean, substantial grid charging locally? Um, How's that going to affect the rest of the grid in Chattanooga? Are they going to add some kind of sustainable something to there to reduce their impact on the grid? So there's there's some things like that we have to work at in addition to like these local power company uh, rate schedules. Yeah. And, and so when you're looking at the electric as, as, as well, let's stick on that for, for just, for just a minute or two, you read different things, right? And some of them are, are uh, about the, the greenhouse footprint or the CO2 footprint of electric vehicles. Right. And some of them are like, they're, they're, they're clickbait headlines, right? I saw one that said, you know, a, a new Tesla takes eight years to become carbon neutral because of the battery. Right. But then you get into well, it depends on this and it depends on that. It depends on all these other things, right? What it what it what what is the closest truth that we know of as far as you know an electric vehicle, a truck, is supposedly X number of times more carbon intensive to produce um, because of the mining and so on and so forth. And we can leave out the you know the the very early stages or the lower ends of, of that mining process, which is just a horror show in, in many, in many locations, or at least in a few, but what, what is it? Is is the EV actually greener? Does it take 10 years for it to become carbon neutral? Uh, Is that battery not worth the, you know, the, the, the effort? Uh, What's your thoughts on that? What are the facts? So I, I think that's just it. You know, I love an old engineering mantra, and that is uh, you can't manage what you can't measure. Right. And so life cycle assessment as a tool has been around for decades in terms of how do I actually compare this and this and try to figure out what are the pros and cons of, of choosing one over the other. We did a life cycle assessment study of uh, CRTs versus LCTs. Remember those big, bulky, gnarly, heavy, you couldn't get too close to them screens we used to look at? Oh, yeah. Well, that was that was Once your, your hair would your hair would like actually move on your body when you walk <laughs> close to them. That's right. I remember it that. even Absolutely. more. Um, but we did a life cycle assessment across seventeen categories of impacts to to humans and the planet, and from comparing the liquid crystal display to the cathode ray tube, we only had one category that was worse for the LCD. And the reason for that is when you looked at the five life cycle stages, which you pull these materials out of the ground, you make pre-materials, you cast them into whatever you need, you turn them into components, then you use them. So the use phase, and then there's end of life. But the use phase for all the electricity you used, because an LCD was like 10 to 15% of the electricity you needed compared to the CRT for the same size screen, 
Yeah. So what happened is use overrode almost everything else that was going, even if you had to mine some crazy thing to make an LCD, it had an impact, but the use, the, the energy use, um, the electricity use during the use phase was a rule. So when we look at cars, most of the pollution we know of from an internal combustion engine is due to what comes out of the tailpipe when you burn it, at least from a human, you know, the human health, air quality impacts. Sometimes yeah, the, the carbon and the nitrous oxide and that type of things. Yeah, that's right. So if you, and what we haven't seen is some good LCD, so some good life cycle assessments that have taken into account and they may be out there now and I've just not seen them, but the mining, the cobalt, the other materials mining in terms of a life cycle of an EV versus internal combustion engine to figure out if, some of those impacts are big enough to overtake what is typically the mighty use phase, where if you're putting fuel through something that's that's a fossil fuel, it's just the impacts are huge throughout the life cycle of that car. So the answer is, I don't know. We need to see some life cycle assessments that are well done to understand where cobalt is mined um, and what kind of, because we know there's some human health, direct human health. Sure. Um, if, if we're in the Congo or wherever it is in Africa that, that cobalt is mined, some of the practices that we wouldn't see here in the U.S. based on our, our uh, making sure people have a reasonable job and place and healthy place to do so. But uh, yeah. we, we need to see those LCAs. But, but my expectation is that while someone may think to mine, you know, an ingot, a kilogram, a ton of cobalt equals X impacts, when you take the amount that's used in each vehicle, it subsides a significant amount such that the use phase using electricity or using gasoline still rules. Gotcha. So when you get you get it down to the individual unit of transportation, then it then it starts to get. I, I got you. So what about uh, what about the impacts of electricity versus you know upgrading our our grid and can the grid be upgraded significantly and cost effectively in order to handle what we have? Like you, you see these, these reports like in California is one of the most because Tennessee, as far as I know, doesn't say, Hey, no more internal combustion engines after 2030 or something like that. Right. That I know of, I don't think there is, but in, you, you see it in California because they usually lead the way with these mandates that the rest of the country goes, Oh, that's ridiculous. But in effect, they do drive us forward. So I like the aspect that they're constantly challenging us to move forward because we need to move forward. But then somebody will say, well, that means we need 5,000 new EV charging stations produced a day or whatever the number is. And there's no way to get this. Can we get to a reasonable place? And is it reasonable to upgrade the electric grid to be able to handle all this? Well, you know, when, when new industry come and land in, Georgia, Tennessee, California, wherever, somebody figures out how they're going to get the electricity because by George, that's jobs. We're going to make it happen. Yeah. Um, in, in this day and age, companies are being a little bit more careful and trying to figure out how they may be able to produce some part or closer to all of the electricity they may need, for example, um, to offset their need to the grid. My understanding is that some of that will take place at the new Ford plant in Stanton, Tennessee, but they're still going to need grid power. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when when people talk about new industry coming to an area and it equals jobs, everybody forgets the impact that that place is going to need electricity. It's got to come from somewhere. So it feels like the EV gets singled out. Now, we are talking numbers. I mean, we have 25,000-ish total plug-in EVs in Tennessee right now. What happens if we hit 200,000 or a million, you know, a seventh of all the light duty vehicles we have in the state or something? Um, I think we are going to look at more sustainable solutions. A good example of one, I think the name of the company is Block Energy, but they work with if somebody's going to build a new subdivision in, let's say, Farragut, Tennessee, and, you know, it's fairly nice homes, there's going to be a hundred of them in this subdivision. Block Energy uses uh creates a solar farm nearby to to cover most of that energy uses a uh, battery system in the neighborhood that is going to store some of that so when the power goes out all the houses still have electricity is it just enough to run the refrigerator can you still run your whole house 
Um, they're building the new subdivision so they can put all the electric stuff underground instead of above ground. I mean, that's where you typically see it in nicer neighborhoods anyway. But um, so there, there are thoughts to how we do things different instead of just building a new neighborhood of 100 houses and putting it on the grid. So yeah, I absolutely. Some of that is going to be required. Absolutely. And I'll give you, I don't know, are you familiar with a company out of the UK called Hemspan, H-E-M span, one word? I am not. Check them, check them out when you get a chance on what they're doing there. I've had, I've had their, uh, Matthew Belcher, their, the founder on, on the show before. And one of their projects that they're doing right now, or the main project is they're building, I think it's 200 homes in the UK that are made out of sustainable building materials. His particular company makes uh, different materials out of hemp, uh, you know, uh, uh, insulation, et cetera. But uh, what they're doing is this, this, uh, and it's, it's in conjunction with some other companies, but this, this uh, neighborhood will be not only carbon negative, uh, but it will also be energy positive into the grid uh, is the plan. Right. Which is which is interesting, not positive in a way that it's really going to you can't you know, you're not, they're not going to, you know, give them enough you know, power to power the whole city. But they're not drawing power off the grid. They're actually producing power onto the grid is is the theory and what they're doing. It's pretty cool stuff. And Check I, it out. I think what we've done is basically cracked the nut with a lot of people thinking about it over the last 10 to 20 years of some of these solutions that are more sustainable. And people would have laughed at them 30 years ago or they may not have been able to find the funding to do scale or closer to scale tests. of. So if he needs to make this hemp blocks or whatever it is in volume, how does he get to a point to where he figures out he can actually make this work based on costs as well as create the benefits you were talking about with energy? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, a lot of people need to invest in this type of stuff and it's trial and error, et cetera. And I asked him, you know, why, why hemp? Why, why not bamboo or whatever? Apparently hemp is a really, really good alternative off, you know, when you're doing your, your, uh, your crop rotations, it's a great off crop to, to do it. It returns a lot of nutrients into the soil. Plus it produces the flower or the stalks, which they actually take, not the flower, they take the stalks and et cetera. So anyways, it's got a, it's got a lot of benefits, but speaking about that, um, you're, you're talking about like, um, what, what is it? Agrivoltaics, et cetera, that type of stuff. Is that type of stuff that you're looking at that you're saying like in these, in these, in these, uh, communities, in these housing subdivisions, like I went down to Peppa Pig world down in outside of it, uh, Orlando. Right. And for my kids they are young and, and, and myself, cause I like Grampy Pig. He's awesome. But anyways, uh, they, uh, or Mr. Bull, if you've ever seen it, uh, but you have to pay premium to park underneath the solar panels right? Because your car's shaded. So they get premium costs for your parking to park under the solar panels to support the solar panels, which are then flat, providing the power to the, to the, to the, uh, to the plant, which I, I think is, is brilliant, right? I mean, we could do that all over the place as far as charging for, for vehicles. Could we not? This is Florida. I mean, it's like insane not to do it. If you ask me, especially with the cost of solar panels going down, but you know, and if, if I'm in Florida, let's just say one of these is outside Disney World. There's a massive parking lot out there. Do I want my Tesla to bake in the sun for nine hours? Or do I want to pay 20 bucks to it to be under? Yeah, it's a smart car. I can have the AC on, but it's using the electricity versus just give me some shade. I'd, I'd pay for it. And that just puts power into the grid in a, in a case where it's not needed where it is. Exactly. Making it for Disney World or the city or whatever. Doesn't doesn't matter, does it? I mean, there's there's there's, there's more uses that are out there. So um, obviously you're high on electricity, but you're also high on on other or positive, I should say. <laughs> you're not actually high. He's not high, uh, but uh, that I'm I know. Really excited talking about it, but <laughs> but you're you're really high on CNG and RNG, et cetera, right? What about hydrogen? What about H? Uh, um, what about hydrogen? What about green hydrogen versus blue or blue hydrogen versus green or all that type of stuff? What's wrong with hydrogen? So I'm, I'm 54. I've been around the barn a few times. Um, in 1998, 1980, in 10 years, hydrogen was going to be the fuel of the future. Yeah. Uh, I so remember. here comes 1990. In, in 10 years, hydrogen is going to be the fuel of the future. Well, here comes 20, 2000. 
in 10 years, it's going to be the fuel of the future. Now, obviously, there's a lot going on now that hasn't been around before, but between the cost of the hydrogen and how are you going to make it, and people talk about green hydrogen, typically meaning you're going to use renewably produced electricity to drive water separation, which is very energy intense, which means from a greenhouse gas production perspective, it may be a significant reduction for all the hydrogen you produced and used in these trucks or whatever. But if you could have taken that same electricity because it's an inefficient process and driven 10 times the amount of electric trucks directly, this, this gets me back to life cycle assessment thinking. I need to see more data on how we're going to do this instead of just claiming it's going to be green hydrogen and we'll produce it renewably. Because if you look at that and compare it to what else, what else you could have done with the electricity, would any reasonable person look at that and go, that's a good decision? So, yeah, I don't know, because what I keep looking at is the degrees of separation, right? Kind of like, you know, playing the game, you know, Kevin Bacon when you were in college. Uh, but it, it's it's really OK. If we use hydrogen, right? OK, so if if it's green hydrogen, then it was produced using a ton of electricity that was produced in a green method versus taking that green electricity and just and just powering the vehicle. I mean, why, why are we adding this other step to it? If the electricity is already green, what, what's, what's, what's the other step for? Is it? Yeah, and if the electricity is already green, why, do you, why are you going to use it directly? I think hydrogen production is where the issues fall for hydrogen, if you ask me, but uh, there's probably some LCAs I need to, to read. Yeah, there probably are. I mean, there's there's a bunch of things. I mean, even even uh, highly on Thomas Healy was was on and he was talking about, you know, they're using RNG uh, because he thinks and they're convinced that hydrogen will be there in the future, but it isn't right now. And so they're using the RNG in it and it works out famously right now. The problem is, can there be an R, enough RNG? And if we decide RNG is it and we're going to produce more RNG, are there negatives to the ability to produce RNG or is there enough out there if we just cap and really uh, manage our waste cycle more, right? Like, you know, the manure pits, et cetera. Well, I guess that's methane really, but uh, the, the uh, you know, are we going to cap and manage our, 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 our landfills better uh, to be able to do this? And is there enough RNG to do that? Even if we did I, that. I, think, I, I have no doubt there's a limit. And that limit compared to all the diesel used in long haul trucking in the U.S. is probably two totally different numbers. I wouldn't be surprised. I, I would imagine. I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot yeah. of diesel. It um, is a lot of diesel. And let's just use a number. Let's let's say, you know, if, if all the diesel use in a year in long haul trucking was X and all the RNG on its rosiest forecast, whatever it be, is 15 percent of that. I'm pulling a number out of my wallet. I don't know if it's 0.5 or 40%. Yeah, I don't um, know either. I know it's not, it can't, it's not as much, I'm, I'm sure. The, the upside to that, even if it's only 15%, is thanks to Cummins and that new 15 liter engine, they are calling it a fuel agnostic engine. So you could run it on compressed natural gas that was renewably produced or RNG and then switch to hydrogen later on. Now, they may need to the storage. They may change the storage tanks in the, some of the systems that are on the truck. But if the engine will then run hydrogen, I think a lot of what we're trying to figure out is we don't have a solution that's going to We can't just say, OK, all gas and diesel will turn to blank, you know, hemp derived fuels, whatever in the future. We, we can't we use too much. So we, we've got to look at a mix. And that's what makes me love the Clean Cities program so much is find a solution that works better, even though we may be talking about electric a lot. What's the Clean Cities initiative? What, what is that? Clean, so the DOE Clean Cities program, what we're supposed to be is, is a fuel agnostic um, reference for people that want to learn. Let, let's say it's um, Mayfields. Mayfields like class six trucks that run, run all over from Athens, right. Tennessee, yep. or whether yep. it's a UPS yep. or whether it's, it's the um, city of McMinnville, you know, those are different scales in terms of use in the fleet size is going to vary. Mayfield trucks, boy, there's a whole lot of those, whatever those are class six refrigerated trucks. UPS has a 
bunch of over the road class eights. And then they also had the delivery trucks. And more and more, we see them getting down into light duty where there's specialized service and they got a minivan they're running around in. Uh, and then a city's going to have everything. They got some dump trucks, they got fire trucks, and then they got all kinds of cars and, and work trucks. So you have to work with each one to figure out what solution would best work for them. And those solutions are probably going to come in pieces. They're going to figure something out with F50s that might also work with cars, but is not going to work for anything that runs diesel. So they're going to have to think about RNG, hydrogen, electric, um, whatever else may be that would fuel stuff that's on the heavy end. Our, our purpose is to help them look at those options, find suppliers if they aren't obvious, um, discuss the pricing of that, and, and try to bring other people to bear that may be more knowledgeable than us on other aspects of that. Like you get into a utility for electric. Well, I don't know all the specifics. I may need to talk to the lower local power company so they can really figure out what are these numbers going to be if somebody changes three school buses to electric. Very interesting. Yeah. So it's not one solution. It's It's got to be multiple. If you look at one solution, you're looking at this as like a single stream, you're going to miss the boat, right? I mean, it's just, it's like you have your favorites at the moment, but the favorites like you're pointing out are different for each type of application and it may be different by region right i mean maybe it's just not regional like you were talking about ohio you're not going to depend on hydro uh, electric in ohio as much as you could in washington state right so in ohio you may have to you may have to be looking at uh, importing it or just going nuke right I, I personally stumbled on something that i love somebody said a long time ago he thought uh, told me 15 years ago nuclear was almost a fuel source ahead of its time for the U.S. because we just really didn't know what to do with the waste. And we still need to learn some things on safety. But yeah, nuclear is something I'm a big fan of. I'm happy to see TVA and I think ORNL working on a smaller scale, safer um, nuclear plant that I think is going to be in Morgan County. It's somewhere to the west of Oak Ridge. So want to see that. But, but yes, each group needs to, each fleet needs to look at um, what their options are and um, and validate those. Make sure they talk to the fuel supplier and everybody else that's involved in the value chain about how is that going to, to work for them because biofuels that are available in Kansas or Indiana may not be easily available in Alabama or Tennessee. And fossil fuels that are in certain parts of the United States may be harder to get and, and do the compression and those things in other parts of the U.S., uh, renewable diesel. I mean, 20 years ago, if somebody said renewable diesel, this they would have said, well, that's the biggest oxymoron that's ever been because we didn't have it. Well, if they finally figured out how to take a petroleum refinery and instead of sticking crude oil in the end, get renewable materials, cooking oils, whatever it may be, and then you can you go through the exact same process and you end up with diesel, gasoline and propane and ethene and the gases and the bitumen at the bottom that uh, now all have greenhouse gas reduction connections that may be 50 to 90 percent. Yeah. So there's even people trying to that are working on methods of creating fuels out of out of waste plastics as well, which is which is there's a lot of exciting things and a lot of a lot of big opportunities. What what do you what about the fleets that are out there and trying to do this? Should they be should they be looking at alternatives like uh, um, you know greener diesel or looking at the technology that burns diesel better? Right, there's a number of products that are out there that inject this or inject that, and they burn the diesel molecule more efficiently, so it reduces uh, uh, emissions, etc. Um, they're smaller steps, right, towards green, but they have their place, do they not? In that particular case, I think too many times out of 10, it's more snake oil than it is beneficial. Oh, okay. It's my opinion from what I've seen. Um, now, if, if you're going to displace diesel with basically soybean oil or used restaurant oil, um, we can pretty cleanly track the greenhouse gas history of that and figure out what kind of reductions you're going to get. If some fleet that uses diesel uses B20, which is 20% biodiesel blended with 80% petroleum diesel, they're going to get about a 15% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions for every gallon of B20 they use. It shouldn't affect power 
um, a, they really were going to have almost no problems. And their fleets out there use B-50 and B-100, pure biodiesel. But if a fleet can use B-20, um, especially if, if they, they use a lot of fuel at their home office and they take off, even if they use fuel in public places, and so they switch back and forth between 20% biodiesel and just diesel, that engine shouldn't have any problem with that switch, and they've taken a small step toward doing something. So the, the additives I'm not as much a huge fan of. If you're going to actually change the fuel, um, that's, that's where we work, and that's where I've seen more you know, proven results. But, but real quickly, back to your point, all we've talked about is alternative fuels. Right. So if you, if you look at Chattanooga, or, I mean, look at Nashville and the, the traffic problems they're having. If you can figure out some other ways to move people, build more bike lanes, green um, areas where people can jog to work if they want to, figure out a way to do mass transit that's not just city buses. Um, because you look at most major cities in the U.S., they have mass transit systems. They have those because they have so many people going in so many directions. Roads would be insane. Now, they have roads, but if they moved everybody off of mass transit onto those roads, boy, would that be a traffic jam you would not want to be in. So all of those have a place in the long-term sustainability we're looking for. It's just like in Knoxville, we don't have enough people to do from downtown out west where a lot of people live along the I-40, I-75 and Kingston Pike Corridor. We just don't have enough people to make mass transit work along that stretch. But each city almost needs to look at this in their own way and figure out what are those steps they can make that can also positively impact reducing emissions while they might make people healthier and happier by getting exercise while they also transport themselves. Absolutely. I mean, isn't, I mean, the infrastructure of our surface transportation is a, is a big um, polluter as well, right? I mean, just because of the bottlenecks. I mean, you you have gone through seventy five twenty four split in, Ch- in Chattanooga, right? Yes. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So, and and that's something we often don't talk about too much. I mean, that's not the field that I work in in terms of alternative transportation. One of the reasons we wanted to do the clean cities work on alternative fuels is almost nobody was doing that in our part of the state, right. but you know, Smart Trips in Knoxville works on trying to get people to ride share and use more busing. They provide incentives, things like that. Um, Chattanooga has a great busing system in the rich history of the, at least the downtown shuttles with the, you know, some of the first electric mass transit in the country. Uh, and then now you've got electric full-size buses. I think it might be five or six that are running around town, and I'm sure Card is looking at more. But How else do they make more ways for Chattanoogans to move around the community where you don't have to get into your car? It's not. And and they're they're free. free. And the downtown ones are free. You just jump on and go. That's right. Um, But that's part of the challenge in the long term sustainability of what we're doing, because you and I go to Amsterdam and some other European cities. Fifty percent of the people are on bikes. They're walking. They're doing something other than getting in a car and going somewhere. So I, I, I don't know that I think we need different groups of people focusing on different parts of these solutions. So if that's where clean cities is focusing on fleets. Individuals are making their discussion or are making their changes. And we're seeing EV adoption in the light duty market um, starting to breach these five per six, five to six percent, which our experience from other countries said you're going to blink. And in a couple of years, that's going to be 20 percent the annual adoption rate of light duty EVs, but fleets don't often really, some do look at this very carefully, Uh, look at UPS and their rolling laboratory for years. They've been looking at alternative fuels and proving these things on the road, but a lot of other fleets, especially if you want to talk about small to medium sized cities, they probably don't spend a, a minute a year thinking about how are we going to reduce our carbon footprint from our fleet? They're worried about how are they going to pay for their next truck. So that's where groups like Clean Cities can come in and try to pair them with some funding and or just straight up with some fuel show them you don't need any funding. You If you'll, if you'll accept a four-year payback period, you could start growing this, have the infrastructure, and then grow your fleet over time and see cost savings while you're trying to do good something for uh, this uh, dear planet that we all happen to like. Amen. So you guys are doing a lot of, a lot of really good stuff there. And, and as we were 
talking and going back and forth before before the show, you you have a list of some of the really EV related businesses that are blooming in in Tennessee, right? Can you talk about yep. that a, a bit? Because I always talk about, you know, in sustainability, a lot of uh, CEOs that I talk to and CFOs especially think about, and they should, think about the cost versus, you know, the, the ROI that it, that is happening. And, you know, more and more you're seeing that it, as long as it, it, it can be incorporated in your business and produce an ROI. Um, and my contention is that this, this whole drive towards sustainability just creates these enormous blue oceans of opportunity um, and, and job creation, et cetera, that can be both good economically, socially, and for the environment, right? I mean, you talk about some of these that are coming into Tennessee just on the EV front. Well, it, it, let's just start with EVs, but obviously we've had Nissan here forever. Um, thanks, Bob Corker and company for bringing VW to Chattanooga. Talk about jobs. Um, and now they're, they're starting to make EVs there, which in Tennessee just averages if somebody in Tennessee switches a light duty vehicle that's gasoline to something similar where they had a car SUV to an EV and uses TVA grid power, it's probably going to be about a 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. For some people, it wow. might be higher. For some people, that might be lower. Um, but Because it, TVA it's, is really right. clean. It's really clean energy, TVA, right? That's exactly right. And it's why. I mean, they've gone, TVA has gone from 56% coal in like 2005 to I think it's 18% in 2020, 2021. So that's what's driving that improvement. Um, but, uh, oh gosh, where, what, what was my point before that? Um, we were talking oh, about the business. The, yeah. Nissan VW. Then here, um, you know, for, for those old enough to remember the Saturn and the, the Saturn events that would happen in Spring Hill, you know, they, they'd have their own kind of crazy saturn Rama. The Saturn um, now plant. That plant is making the Lyric and it will be making, I think it's two Lexus EVs that I've seen commercials for like during the Super Bowl and such. Oh, wow. Um, then here comes Ford with the $6.1 billion investment in Stanton, Tennessee, which is just outside Memphis to build what is going to be the, the next generation Ford Lightning. We all know Americans love their trucks. I have no idea how many people that get up 150s use them to haul max load every once in a while versus just like them because they're cool and have three people or maybe three bales of hay in the back every once in a while. Um, but then there's the, excel the the accessories. There's the there's like two or three companies that are going to make products in Clarksville, Tennessee, that are related to batteries and battery components. Piedmont Lithium coming near us back in Etowah, that's going to, they're not going to mine there. They're going to process to make right. that, that, that's a, the That's like Athens Sweetwater Way, right? Somewhere in that area. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And then what, there's the, is it graphene? There's some kind of graphite or graphite component factory that's coming up in Chattanooga. That's right. I so think it's we're, graphene. We're starting graphene. to see these and it's, it's enabling Tennessee to become the Michigan of the South from an automotive perspective. So... <laughs> Don't I'm, say that. I'm, I'm from Ohio, you. man. I'm going to have to move. I'm from Ohio. I'm going to have to move now. I got to tell you, I've seen a lot of great biogas and <laughs> renewable natural gas operations in Ohio. All right. There we Literally go. been there and seen the processes myself. <laughs> excellent. excellent. Um, but but there, there's, I think in the end, this stuff has to go hand in hand. We've got to have people out there working on the alt transportation for communities. <clears throat> We've yeah. got to focus on individuals and the fleets and help them get the tools they need, like the Act Expo that I just went to with 12,000 people strong in Anaheim, California. I mean, let me tell you, electric was the fuel out there, although hydrogen, propane, natural gas, RNG, you saw all those and, and a few other things. But um, I think a lot of people are excited about electric. I think we've got we can make huge gains in reducing the transportation greenhouse gas emissions with electricity. But we're going to be solving problems along the way as much as we are trying to solve those problems in advance, because a lot of times what we see right now just in charging infrastructure for light duty vehicles, if you and I drive up in a Tesla to a Tesla supercharger, 99.9% .9 of the time we plug it in and it works. If we go to any other manufacturer and we go out there, it might be 
one out or two out of five times we go plug in that something's not working. So the reliability of just the charging infrastructure beyond the rest of the environmental impacts that may come with EVs and their components. So there's a lot of things we have to solve moving down the road, but so that's it's really, but that's really the long movie. trips, right? I mean, I, I have a car that we take on our trips, and I, but I have a car that we just cruise around Hamilton County, Chattanooga, stuff like that, right? I, I should be good. I can charge at home. Charge at home, get you an app, Tara, to cruise around town. If you have any kids, they're going to think you're the coolest thing ever. I am the coolest and, thing already, uh, so I blow their mind. Everybody <laughs> will look at you. You can put Sustaniacs on the side in the web address. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> what is it? An Aptera? Aptera. Google A P T E R A. Talk about a funky looking EV. I hope they survive. They've been around a while, but uh, they have lots of orders. I think they haven't delivered any yet. But supposedly, for the person that keeps it on the you know thirty five mile an hour streets and less, you're talking about a thousand miles on a charge. Is it? No, this is, I'm looking at their solar electric car, I think is what the, I'm That's looking right. at. And, and so no, it we're, we're going to continue. The vehicle up there, a solar electric car. Yeah, that's yep. very cool. Yeah, now, I could see and that. We're going to continue to see gains in efficiencies with batteries. So you can go further on the same number of kilowatt hours. Um, we're going to continue to see gains in solar. Um so I'm I'm kind of excited for the transitional period that we're in and seeing what we do, knowing that we're going to stumble in some ways with right. the technology that we have. But, um, you know, I think it comes down to what can each person do in a day to make a difference. Right. And everybody has to figure out what they can tackle. And so um, for me, Clean Cities has been tremendously rewarding along the way. Um, as we try to help people make a change for whatever we can do. We're not going to help the UPSs as much as we are going to help uh, the little guys that don't have the staff and the time to focus on this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very true. Very true. Very true. That's excellent stuff. Jonathan, thank you so much for being on the on the show. Where do people go and learn more about Clean Fuels Tennessee or Tennessee Clean Fuels, sorry, dot org? I, I guess that's where they go, right? Uh, there, there's two websites I'd recommend, tncleanfuels.org, kind of we shorten Tennessee, but tncleanfuels.org, and then driveelectrictn.org. So if they're interested in electric vehicle stuff, driveelectrictn.org. Uh, if they want to talk about electric or any other fuel and look, get in touch with one of us to talk about any fuel and how it might work for them, tncleanfuels.org. Very cool. Appreciate it very much, Jonathan. Peace and love, my friend. My, pres my pleasure. Appreciate it, Mike. Right on.